welcome back to my channel. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're seeing my face for the very first time, please don't forget to hit that red button to join the family. Please join the Nelly Nels family because every week I dish out new videos. I talk about immigration, lifestyle, food, everything and anything okay i discuss that here on my channel and of course if you're a returning subscriber thanks so much for always checking me out for always coming back thank you guys thank you so in today's video my friend is here deborah Debbie has been my friend for close to 12 years now we've been very good friends debbie is so smart she's a brain box like literally she's a brain box debbie is the youngest person in the whole of nigeria to obtain a phd my friend Debbie obtained her PhD at the age of 25. Oh my God, what? At the age of 25, she obtained her PhD from Covenant University. Debbie, my friend, is also an author. She's the author of this book, Smart Goals. Debbie is the CEO of an NGO in Nigeria called Volunteer Nigeria. Debbie, my friend, is a lecturer here in Canada. What? Did you guys hear me? My friend Debbie is a lecturer and she has obtained and she has been able to do all these things all before the age of 30. She's still in her 20s and she's achieved so much. She has achieved so much. Like, I mean, I'm in awe of Debbie. She's always smashing glass ceilings. There's no stopping her. The sky is not a limit for Deborah. Debbie, please, please, please come on board. Tell me what is your secret. Guys, please stay tuned. <laughs> for being here girl thank you so much for collaborating with me thanks Debs I am dying to know I'm sure my viewers are itching to know as well what is your motivating factor my goodness Debbie it seems like there is no holding you back you have that it factor you have that oomph factor the sky is not the limit for you you're continuously and continually breaking and smashing glass ceilings Debbie please tell us what is it about you You've achieved all these things at such a young age. You're not even 30 yet. You're still in your 20s and you've done so much for yourself. Please tell us what is your motivating factor. Hi, Lydia. Thank you so much for having me on your channel. I am super excited to be here and I really hope the two or three things I say will be beneficial to your viewers. Um, just like Lydia said earlier, I can't believe it's been 12 years of knowing you. Um, I don't think she said this earlier, but she stole me from her sister. Her sister was my best friend. And then um, Lydia and I just clicked and we became best buds ever since. Um, so your first question is, what motivates me? I think the, the main thing that motivates me is to leave a legacy. So um, I know that our time here on earth is short. So no matter how many years you leave, so give and take in our generation, we'll have people living up to 100, so 110, 115, 120, etc. By the end of it all, when you go, what do people remember you for? So how many lives are you able to impact? How many things have you done that people can always go back and say, oh yeah, remember Debbie that lived in this world hundreds of years ago? This is what she did or this is what he did. So for me, it's always the need to leave a legacy i don't want to go and everyone just forgets me because i heard this sometime somewhere that you die twice as a human being you die the first time you die and then the second time is when all the people you knew on earth also die so i want my existence to go beyond that i want to be able to help people i want to be able to impact on people i want to give as much as i can and um in doing all of that, I need to be a better person. So in being a better person is being better at my job. In being a better person means being more educated. In being a better person means starting non-for-profit. In being a better person means writing books. So all of these things that I have done are all just because I want to be a better person so I can be helpful to others and so I can also leave a legacy when I die. Amazing, baby. Thanks for that. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. The big question. How were you able to get qualified as a lecturer here in Canada? I'm guessing it must be very tedious and very grueling, very demanding. So please tell us what are the procedures? What's the requirement towards becoming a lecturer here in Canada? You know, someone coming from Nigeria, how can they get into academia or perhaps become a lecturer here in Canada as well? So please tell us. Um, becoming a lecturer here was not as difficult as I thought it would be, if I'm being honest with you. Um, 
I had the qualifications already. So I already had a PhD. I had already been teaching for over four years. Um, I had the knowledge. I had the people skills as well. So it wasn't as difficult as, you know, as I assumed it was going to be. What I would say to anyone coming from any country, regardless of the country you're coming from, and regardless of the industry you're about to enter into, is just make sure you have the qualifications needed. Make sure you have the degrees needed to get a job. Make sure you have the experience already. And then having all of this is one good thing, but being able to communicate it is another thing. So when you're going for interviews, I know we all have different accents based on where we are from, based on how we grew up. But when you're going for interviews, for example, please make sure that you are able to communicate very well. Make sure you're able to express yourself. Make sure you're able to give out all the knowledge that you have at interviews. So for me, my first real job as an instructor here in, um, in Canada, I got it through coffee. So I had sent emails to several people. So this is what I do. And I've done it twice and it has worked out well for me. When I move to a new city, I look at the universities or colleges that I'd like to teach at. And then I go through the list of all the faculty in that, inst that um, institution. And then I send them emails. So the first one I did was, hi, my name is Debbie. I just moved to Calgary because I was in Calgary then. I just moved to Calgary. Um, I have this and this experience. I would like to meet you for coffee. I want to know how is it... Uh, I want to know the process it will take for me to get into an institution as great as your institution. So it's one, talking about the person that you're sending the emails to. Oh, I read your profile. You're such an amazing. You've done this. You've done that. You've done that. Oh, and I read about the school as well. The school is so amazing. It's done this, done that. Now, me, myself, I am amazing. Well, I wouldn't say I'm amazing, but that's how I'll put it. And then these are all the qualifications that I have. And then adding all of those together and sending emails. So I probably sent up to hundreds of emails when I just moved in. And then someone reached out to me one time. I'm like, oh, Debbie, um, can you meet up for coffee next week? And I'm like, sure, absolutely. And then I went to went for coffee. After coffee, that was it. The next thing I knew was they were sending me a contract. So I didn't even have like a proper interview. So I realized that most of the teaching jobs I've had since I moved to Canada, I've not really had a proper interview. It's been me sending emails and someone saying, come, let's have coffee. Let's have a conversation. And then from there, you realize that I get the job. So it's just knowing your onions, knowing how to package yourself and then going out there, be determined. Just reach out, reach out, reach out to as many people as possible. Brilliant. Thanks for that. So Debbie, like what sort of reception do you get? When you tell someone that you're a lecturer, what sort of reception do you get? Especially being a young Nigerian girl. Are they like, oh wow, that's amazing. Or can you sense some sort of racism in school, in your faculty, within your students? Just, I'm just trying to guess, or I'm thinking out loud, how is it you know, being a lecturer, a Nigerian lecturer here in Canada, what sort of reception do you get from your faculty members, just from people in general? Please tell us. Um, that is an interesting question because I think I got exactly the same type of reaction when I was in Nigeria as I am here as well. Well, I started teaching when I was 22. Yeah, I, started, I worked at Covenant University, at I started at 22. And most of the students I was teaching were like my age. So every time it's like, oh, that's, that's Debbie. She's an assistant lecturer. And I was going to be like, really? You're a lecturer? So it's the same reaction I even get here. Now, the good thing is I've added some weight. <laughs> so I don't look as young as I used to look then. And so I still get the once in a while, oh, you're so young. But apart from that, um, it's still the same reaction. Now let's talk about more in-depth reactions. So in the classrooms, for example, um, what I, I wouldn't say I've received any direct racism. However, um, between when I came and now I've had to tweak around my teaching methods and my teaching processes to fit the students that are here. So when I came, I came with the Nigerian teacher mentality. You know, when you're asking your students questions, you expect them to answer. I used to speak fast. I would ramble through and try to have it engaging, but at the same time, so my students struggled with that. So they struggled with it because I myself was not teaching the way they could understand. I was teaching the way a Nigerian student would understand. And so the first term, if when I check my ratings, I'm like, ee, what is going on here? But after that, I took all the feedback that I got. So I usually would ask for feedback from my students at the beginning and the ending of the class. Um, at the beginning, we do an expectation card. Then at the end, we do a feedback card. 
so um i took all the feedback that i got and then i reworked them i retweaked them started talking a bit slower you know explaining things differently bringing things more from the canadian perspective and when i did all of these things around turned them around i realized that the reception i got was better than it was at the beginning so i wouldn't say i have been a victim of racism per se i've just had to change and tweak around my method of teaching just to fit the canadian student um among faculty I've had amazing friends, colleagues, we go out for drinks, we chill, we hang out, but um, I tend to always still leave that gap, you know, you're my work friend, when I get home, that's different. Um, but yeah, it's it's been amazing, it's been a thing of just tweaking and changing things around just to fit the system that I am in now. So Debbie, like, what's your number one advice to anyone that's thinking of relocating to Canada, America, Europe, wherever? Like, what's your number one um, advice to them? Because you've been here in Canada for some years now, and you, I think you've settled in very well into society. So just tell us, like, what's your number one advice to anyone that's thinking of relocating, you know, living in Nigeria to come here to Canada or anywhere in the world? Please tell us. Advice to anyone that's trying to relocate to Canada or any other place in the world? World, I'll divide my advice into two categories. So work related, um, brush up your skills, brush up your resume, reach out to people that are already in the country you're aiming to go to, F send them your resume, send them your um, skills and qualifications, let them give you their thoughts, their feedback on all of this document. Um, beyond that, you want to be able to defend yourself. So, for example, if I am a recruiter and I am trying to recruit a person for a particular position, it's easier for me to determine how great a candidate is if I know the company that you are coming from. So if you're coming from a PWC, for example, or you're coming from an organization that is just down the road, I already have a perception about that organization. So if a person has worked there for four years, five years, I can easily tell what kind of a human being they might be, at least to an extent. I know there's a bias there, but that's the general perception that recruiters will have. However, if you're coming all the way from Nigeria, you're coming from another country, and then you're trying to get a job in my organization, I can't for sure say what kind of skills you have. It might look so great on resume, but doesn't really tell me a lot because I don't know much about the company that you're coming from. So what would really sell you as a person is actually being able to defend your skills. So when you go into an interview, you have to be exceptional. You have to be more than every other person. So if every other person that is from that country is giving it a six you have to give it a ten if you're not able to give it a ten you realize that you might not get the job so first brush up your skills brush up your knowledge brush up your resume brush up all of this documentation when you're going for interviews do a lot of um um practice you know video practice ask your friends for feedback i used to record all my interview questions ahead and speak to them you know just to make sure that i have every answer already done and i'll listen to it and hear how i sound and change a few things around so you want to practice 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 you want to put yourself out there that's another thing be out there i know sometimes if you're from a certain culture you're a woman or or dependent you you have this oh i want to stay behind no if you want to get a job if you want to settle down if you want to get the type of job that you want you have to put yourself out there i i am an ambivert in the sense i'm introverted extroverted um but even though i rather stay at home when i know i need certain um qualifications when i know i need certain opportunities what would i do i'll go out there go for events send messages or oh, can i meet for coffee so you need to put yourself out there you need to defend your resume you need to defend your skills go above and beyond what other people would need for that particular position if you have above and beyond it's very difficult for the recruiter or human resource manager to say no to you so that's that on um, qualification and getting a job site on a personal side, be open-minded, right? You're going to a new country, experience the life, experience what the country has to offer. Just give it more than you ideally would give it in the past, you know? Just be there, experience it, enjoy it. Yes, it's good to have a job, but at the same time, live the life. Don't be afraid, be out there. Yes, I think these are the major advices that I would give. I know you asked me for one, but brilliant debbie thanks for that so debbie you live in vancouver british columbia meanwhile vancouver is the most beautiful city in canada if you guys have not been there please try to go to vancouver because the scenery is to die for vancouver is 10 over 10 however vancouver is also the most expensive place 
like Vancouver and Toronto are competing, you know, in terms of which one is the most expensive place to live. So Debbie, please tell us, like, I, I know there are lots of jobs in Vancouver. So please tell us, like, what sort of jobs are available for immigrants in Vancouver? And roughly, how much do these jobs pay? Because, you know, would you advise someone that's relocating from Nigeria to come straight to Vancouver? Because I know, compared to Calgary where I live, Vancouver has more jobs for immigrants. So what sort of jobs are available for immigrants and roughly how much do these jobs pay? Yes, you are absolutely correct. Vancouver has the most amazing views. I used to live in Calgary before and then I moved to Vancouver and it's been one of my best decisions ever. So yes, Vancouver is so amazing. However, first things first, would I really advise an immigrant to come to Vancouver Street? It depends. If you're a single person, you're coming alone, you have a lot of money that you have saved, yes, maybe you should come to Vancouver first. However, if you are coming with a family, which ideally I don't even advise at the beginning of immigration, um, if you're coming with a family, you have not that much money, you are not sure where your next meal will be, you really need to get a job as soon as possible, I don't know if I would really advise you to come to Vancouver, except you have family or friends already here. So for me, it was easier because I am single, I could come and, you know, I didn't have to look for the best of houses. As long as I got something that I could really sleep in and was comfortable with. Plus, I'd already been in Calgary. I had made some money there. I had a lot of savings. So it was easier for me to transition into the Vancouver life. So first, you want to be very sure that you can easily transition into the Vancouver life because it's a bit more expensive. Just just like you said compared to other cities however there are so many jobs in vancouver and that's the truth um i think the major industries that are flourishing in vancouver are it finance um some kind of construction which is the whole of canada really but yeah construction real estate um i think those are the major media media too is flourishing in vancouver so i like to think that vancouver is like the seattle again we're just beside seattle it's like 40 minutes, 45 minutes driving to, an hour driving to Seattle, right? So we're the Seattle of the state. At the same time, we are the movie central of Canada also. So if you're in any of those industries, then yes, maybe Vancouver will be really great for you. Of course, if you're in oil and gas and you really want to stay in oil and gas, maybe don't come to Vancouver. Um, but yeah, if you're in any of these other industries, Vancouver will be a great option for you. Um, what kind of, how much would you pay? It all depends on your experience. Would you be paid? It all depends on your experience, your qualification, all of that. But you can go to indeed.ca. So that's I-N-D-E-E-D.ca. And then you can see all the jobs that are here in Vancouver. You can also see how much they pay and all the information that you need. Last and final question for you, Debbie, is how can my viewers buy your book, your book, Smart Goals? How can they buy this book and how can they sign up to your NGO, Volunteer Nigeria? So please tell us how can they buy this book and how can they sign up to this NGO? Also, what's next for you, Deborah? Like you've done so much, like I said already. So in the next five years, in the next 10 years, what are we hoping to see from you? What's in your to-do list? What's in the horizon for you? Please tell us, like, what are your goals and aspirations? Thank you, Lydia, for talking about my book. So this is the first book that I have written so far. I am so excited that I was able to follow through with it. It's called Smart Goals. I know the picture here looks like a child, a young child. But no, this is for anyone from the ages of 14 all the way to, I would say, 40. But older than 40, sure, if you're still trying to set goals, absolutely, which you should be anyway. Um, so Smart Goals is, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Smart Goals is a goal setting journal. So it's pretty much made out like a journal, right? So I start by talking about my, well, not myself, but my past experiences, how I have set goals and how I have been able to achieve them. I divided goals. In, I, I usually would make sure my goals are smart in the sense that they are specific, they are measurable, they are achievable, they are realistic and they are time bound. So that's what I usually would do. And that's what I talked about within the book. Um, also, I talked about breaking your goals into habits. So at the end of it all, you want to do something great. But if you don't have the habit of that, then it's going to be difficult for you. So this year, for example, I'm trying to be more fit. That's my goal. I want to lose certain pounds or I want to have just, you know, slim pack stomach, summer body. So what habits do I need to take up for me to achieve that goal? So habits such as eating healthy, exercising. So the last three days, I've been doing 10 kilometers runs. 
um hopefully i can do some five kilometer today so those are the small small goals that i'm doing every other day just for me to achieve or small small habits that i'm taking up just for me to achieve my goal so i talked about all of that within the book how you can set these goals how you can divide them into habits and how you can easily make success and just like my former boss would say dr joe the person that is really successful at the end of life is not the hard worker because if we're looking for hard workers go and see the carpenters go and see the laborers those are the ones that really work hard it's the person that is smart that uses their time effectively that knows how to divide their goals into very effective measures those are the people that are actually going to be successful so to get my book um you can it's on amazon right now it's on amazon just the hard copy which is intentional because it's a journal i need you to write in it um apart from that it is also Okay, so Amazon, if you Google search smart goals, making habits work for you, you should there be Motilewa, you should be able to find it. Nana would also put the link in this page. You can also follow me on Instagram. I have a profile that opens up all the different things I do, and then you can easily find how to get a copy of smart goals. Um, my non-for-profit, the, volu the volunteer NG, um, is targeted at um it's targeted at educating young individuals so um in nigeria for example we have 27 kids that we're currently sponsoring in school um we take them through school we also mentor them etc um, if you want to be a part of the volunteer ng our website is www.devolunteerng.com so you can still find all of this in my instagram page so find me on instagram my instagram handle is dr debbie underscore so d-r-d-e-b-b-i-e -B -B -E underscore and then when you go on my profile there's a link there that lists out all the things i'm involved in and then you can click the one that you're interested in so yeah, that's that. Um, I also have another organization called Charm Vancouver. I'm sure Lydia doesn't know so much about that, hence why she didn't bring it up. But what we're doing is building a community where immigrants can work together in the areas of personal development as well as entrepreneurship. Okay, what's next for me? I feel like I started life really early, so I didn't get to experience some of the very beautiful things that so many people did. So what's next for me is traveling. I want to travel more... Um, last year I did a couple of trips, but now this year everybody's at home thanks to COVID-19. Um, but yeah, I want to travel more. I want to experience life more. I want to be in, um, I want to be married and have kids hopefully in the next five years, before the next five years. Um, I'm working on a second book that is more for entrepreneurship. Um, for social entrepreneurs specifically, I want to do more speaking engagements. I want to grow my non-for-profit organizations to a bigger land or a bigger space. Um, I want to hire more people. I want to motivate more people. Man, five years, there's a lot that is going on in five years. And um, I'm sure you'll be there, Lydia. So you'll be seeing it and you'll be also doing great things as well. And we'll be working together to achieve greatness. Thank you so much for having me on your channel, Lydia. This was so amazing. And I know we've been working on this for a while. So I'm so glad that we finally got it done. Thank you to your viewers as well. I really appreciate being here. And I hope this chat actually helps someone. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, like, subscribe, and share this video. See you guys very soon. Bye.